How's it going y'all? Let's take a look at how authentication works on many modern websites by implementing it ourselves, step by step. We're going to take a look at how sessions, cookies, CSRF tokens, and of course username and passwords all work together to produce secure authentication for a website. So let's dive right in. We're going to need four main things for this. A hash password, something called a session token, and something else called a CSRF token. The fourth thing is a username. We'll store this as a key in a map, which maps usernames to login information. So this is our in-memory database, which we'll use as a stand-in for a real database like Mongo or a SQL database for this tutorial. We're gonna make four different endpoints, one to create an account, one to log in, one to log out, and a test endpoint which will be protected, only accessible to logged in users. For now, the functions which are gonna handle these endpoint requests are gonna be empty. First, let's start with the registration function. This will be handled by a post request. Post methods are generally used for requests which send data and create new resources, which is exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to grab the username and password from the payload form value. We'll do some basic length checks, as well as check if the user already exists. Now it's common practice to send passwords in plain text since most public APIs use HTTPS. This encrypts the data during transmission. However, passwords are always stored in an obfuscated form. This ensures that even if somebody gains access to the database, they won't have direct access to the user's passwords. To obfuscate a password, we use a hashing function. A hashing function is an algorithm that converts data into a fixed size, irreversible string of characters used primarily for data integrity and secure storage, like password protection. The hashing function we'll use is a very commonly used one, which is called Bycrypt. In a new utils file, we'll import Bycrypt from the Golang crypto module. The hash password function will take in the password as a string and we'll call bycrypt.generateFromPassword. This takes a byte representation of the password and a cost factor. The cost factor essentially just controls how slow the algorithm is. A cost factor of 10 means the password is hashed 2 to the power of 10 times. So we hash the password and then hash the hash many, many times. The point of this is to make it slow to generate a hash. This way, if somebody got a hold of the hash passwords, they couldn't just quickly run millions of guesses through the hashing function until they found a match. All right, so then the hash is what we store in the database. Let's try this endpoint out and create a user. So our database now looks like this. Let's see how we would log in a user. This is where we start to use our session and CSRF token. We're going to use a post method again and grab our password and username in the same way as before. The username doesn't exist, just return an error. To check the password, we got to hash it and compare it to the hash that we have in our database. So let's go back to our util file and create a check password hash function. Now the bycrypt package we imported has a compare hash and password function. This will hash the plain text password and compare it to the hash we have stored, all in one line. If there's an error, this means that the passwords didn't match. Let's now add this check to our if statement. If we stopped here, we'd face a major issue. Each time a request is made to the back end, like fetching or updating user data, the client will need to send the username and password for authentication. This would either require the user repeatedly enter their credentials for the website or the web page to store them, both of which are, let's say, bad. This is where session tokens come in. A session token is generated randomly, let's say in a function like this. Here we're using the RAND package to generate a random byte and then returning it as a string in Base64 representation. On a side note, Base64 is a binary to text encoding schema that converts binary data into a string, where the string contains only characters from a specially chosen list of 64 characters. These characters are uppercase letters, lowercase letters, digits, as well as the plus and forward slash symbol. This avoids us using reserved characters like and or at, for example, in our token, which have special uses in HTTP requests. 
All right, so we'll generate a session token in our login handler. But what are we gonna use it for? Well, first we'll store the session token in a cookie which we'll send back to the client. Now the way cookies work is they are automatically sent by the browser to the backend every time a request is made to any endpoint in our database. So this session token will be sent any time a request is made. Now instead of checking login credentials every time, we can just verify that the session token we get in the cookie is the same that we have in our database. Cool, so let's store the session token in our database. Now there are a couple extra things we want to add to our cookie. First is the expiration date. We'll set this to 24 hours. What happens here is the browser will delete the value under that session token key in the cookie after 24 hours. So any subsequent request after 24 hours will have no session token, and hence the user gets automatically logged out this way. Next, key value pairs and cookies also have a flag called HTTP only. This HTTP only flag ensures that the session token can't be accessed by front end JavaScript on the web page. So it's only available to be sent during HTTP requests. So all good, right? Well, not exactly. Using session tokens, we've actually introduced a vulnerability called cross-site request forgery. Here's how this would work. Imagine I'm logged into my bank.com account. Hence, a cookie is stored on my machine with a session token. Suppose I get a link to a malicious website and click on it. Since I'm logged into my bank.com account, any requests the malicious site makes to bank.com will have the cookie data for that site automatically sent along with the request. So the banking website will get the valid session token and treat any requests from the malicious site as legit. For example, transferring all funds out from an account. This is an issue we can solve with CSRF tokens. We can create one in the same way we create a session token here. Similarly, we'll put the CSRF token in the cookie. Except we'll set HTTP only to false. As well, let's store this token in the database for the user. Now let's test this out. We can see that our user now has a session token and CSRF token. Okay, so now how do we actually use the CSRF token? Well, first we need to understand what same origin policy is. This essentially means that the browser blocks web pages from accessing resources meant for other websites like cookies, for example. So the malicious website can't read the cookie information from bank.com, even though the cookie is automatically sent for any requests to bank.com. So let's see how we can use this information in code. We'll create a session file and start writing our authorize function, which will authorize requests. So first we'll grab the username and use that to grab the user data from our database. We can grab the session token we sent from the cookie using the request object. We check it was passed in, is not empty, and then it matches what we have in our database. Otherwise, we reject the request. Now comes the CSRF token. The difference here is that we'll grab this token from the header of the request and not the cookie. So we expect the client to send an X CSRF token field with the CSRF token we sent in the cookie before. So looking back, remember we set the HTTP only flag to false for this. This is because we want to allow the code to actually read the token from the cookie. This way it can add it to the header and send it back. This is important because the browser will only allow this site to read the token from the cookie, i.e. the malicious website can't read this token. So if it sends us back the CSRF token as part of the header, we know the request is coming from the original site. Now all we gotta do is use this function for any protected routes. In fact, let's implement our protected route handler. Here we call the authorize function and deny the request if we get an error back. Otherwise, we'll return a welcome message. Lastly, we'll just fill out our logout handler. This is pretty easy. All we do is authorize the request again. And if everything's okay, we clear the tokens from the cookie. And then clear the tokens from our database. All right, let's test out a secure API and see what happens. First, we're going to register a user. Next, let's try to hit the protected route. So we see we get an unauthorized error. 
This is because we need to log in. So let's do that. When we do that, we get back a session token and a CSRF token. If we hit the protected route again, we get another failure because we didn't pass the CSRF token as part of the header. So let's do that. Trying again and we got our welcome message. We can also now log out and then try the protected route once more. And we get an unauthorized error as expected. And that's it. That's an overview of how authentication works in many modern sites and how you can build it yourself. Thanks for watching.